Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this event uh, run by the South Wales branch of the Royal Society of Biology, entitled Golden and White-Tailed Eagles in Wales, Restoring Our Historic Eagles. My name is Dr Henrietta Stanley. I'm the chair of the South Wales branch committee. We'll be sharing some information about the Royal Society of Biology at the end of tonight's event for any non-members who might be interested in joining. And it's really great to see so many people have joined in with this webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Sophie Lee Williams. Sophie Lee is a raptor biologist who has just completed her PhD with Dr. Rob Thomas and Dr. Sarah Perkins at the Cardiff University School of Biosciences. Just before Sophie Lee starts, I am going to hand over to one of my colleagues on the committee, Jason, who is going to explain how the event is going to work online and also how you can submit questions through the Q&A uh, for Sophie Lee after her presentation. Thank you, Henrietta. So on the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there are, is a menu button or at the top, depending on which platform you're using. Um, this event is being recorded, but unlike our previous events, you don't have to worry about you being shown on the screen because it doesn't do that with this webinar facility. So questions for this evening for Sophie Lee. Um, you can ask your questions through the Q&A chat box located on the menu, either at the bottom or top of your screen. And then you can send your questions during the event, but Sophie Lee will be answering them at the end of tonight's presentation. And I think Sophie Lee's ready. Okay. Let me just share my screen. Adia Henrietta and Jason, thank you very much. Um, and Shamai Pau, hello everyone. And thank you for joining us this evening. So like Henrietta said, my name is Sophie Lee Williams and I am the project founder and manager of the Eagle Reintroduction Wales Project or ERW for short. So just a bit about myself, I am a raptor biologist. I have been working now with raptors for over 12 years um, with Wild and Rehabilitated. I'm a massive Birds of Prey fan um, and I've been working with eagles now for five years and I designed this project when I come back from Scotland um, in 2016 and we found funding in 2017 to launch our feasibility studies and we were luckily funded by the European Social Fund under a PhD Kess scholarship. And um, over the last three years, we've been gathering scientific evidence to assess the feasibility of bringing back our lost eagle species, back to soaring the skies of modern Wales. And we haven't done this alone. We have an extensive team of collaborations and advisors. Our main um, collaborations at Cardiff University, Wild Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation and the Wildlife Trust Wales. And we're also working with um, national and international eagle experts as well. So hopefully today my talk will give you a bit of an insight into how we got the ball rolling with the reintroduction, what evidence we've gathered for our feasibility studies, and to manage people's um, expectations around this topic. We've realised over the last couple of weeks that there's been some ludicrous time, frame, um, time frames being thrown around in the media. So really today my job is to start managing people's expectations around restoring eagles to whales. So what is the main aim of, oh I can't get my, oh, why is the main aim of the ERW project? So the main aim is to assess if modern whales can still hold both the golden and white-tailed eagle. And it's inevitable that the Welsh landscape has changed significantly since eagles last bred here over 150 years ago. But this is not a novel concept. Eagle reintroductions have been suggested for many, many decades, but so far no action has been taken here in Wales. So hopefully today my talk will be about how, why, what and when. So how do we go about a reintroduction? Why are we proposing one? What do we need to consider and when will a reintroduction happen? 
But before we jump to the nitty gritty of the ERW project, it would be rude not to introduce you to our native eagle species. So there's two native eagles to, well, across the British Isles and Wales, and they are the golden eagle known in Welsh as a Riri Uriad and the white-tailed eagle known in Welsh as a Riri Amor. And both species are conservation concern in Britain, and the golden eagle is a conservation conservation concern across Europe and the white-tailed eagle across the globe and they are considered rare birds here in Britain as well. So both eagles uh, belong to the Acridae family which contains eagles, hawks and buzzards and an eagle in lay terms is just a common terminology for many large birds of prey which are active during the day. And it's safe to say that both of our eagle species tick all basic eagle boxes. They are big, they have, they're brown, they have broad wings, and they are commonly seen soaring high in the sky, dwarfing any other bird species that approach them. So both eagles are also um, apex predators in their habitats across Britain, and that is that they sit on top of the food chain and don't really fall prey to any other species. But despite their similarities, um, they're not closely related and they differ significantly in their appearance and lifestyle. So while both species belong to the same eagle family, they are split up into different genre groups. So our golden eagle is part of our booted eagle family um, and they're known for their versatile hunting strategies. They are pursuit hunters, they chase species and they're very agile on the wing. Whereas our white-tailed eagle is from our sea eagle family and they are our biggest bird of prey here in, in Britain. Um, and what a shame that is because they're extremely lazy species. They spend 95% of their day sat waiting, um, perched, wait, waiting for food to come to them. Um, and yeah, so they both have very different um, different biology and ecologies. They also have different habitat preferences across across the globe. So the golden eagle um, occupies mostly remote hills and mountains across Europe, but also can inhabit lowland areas and coastal areas as well, like in Scotland, where they mostly prey upon uh, medium-sized mammals and birds. Whereas the white-tailed eagle is mostly associate, associated to aquatic resources like coastlines, wetlands, estuaries and inland lakes, where they mainly prey upon fish, water birds in the spring, and then change their diet to um, carrion and mammals in the winter. So like I said, both species occupy the role of apex predators across um, their habitat across Britain which makes them a great complementary study species for whales. So how do we go about a reintroduction? So it's not as easy as what most people make out. You can't just click your fingers and release eagles into whales free willy nilly. Reintroduction programmes are usually a strict, highly regulated licensing process. So in the case of Wales, um, the authority figure that are in charge of passing our licences are Natural Resources Wales. And these licence applications um, and feasibility studies are normally in um, the form of multiple reports. So hitting upon the biological, environmental, social, economic feasibility of restoring these species but also the advantages and disadvantages of bringing these species back. And all species um, license applications are different. And it's certainly the case for our licenses for white tails and golden eagles. And that is simply because every species has different critical dependent environment within their ecosystems and on other biodiversity. So how do we know what questions to address? So there's a standard criterion in Britain um, that, you know, for species reintroduction programmes, and that is all set out by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So ERW's research questions um, and licence applications are all shaped around IUCN and NRW requirements. 
so today, um, over, well, over the last three years and today, we will be focusing on mainly the biological and environmental feasibility. So we've now completed, you know, whether eagles can biologically survive in Wales and if the modern Welsh landscape can hold them. So we'll today we'll be touching upon those topics. So why propose a reintroduction? So any properly planned species recovery programme starts by asking, is a reintroduction the most acceptable option for the conservation of these species? And there's multiple ways to um, answer this question, but we're going to focus on three criteria which we believe that's the best um, in describing whether reintroduction is the most acceptable option for eagles in Britain. So the first criteria is the cause of extinction in Wales and has this been reduced or eliminated? And unfortunately, the golden and white-tailed eagle both fell victim to ruthless hunting across Britain and in Wales, a, a common historic trend um, for many population declines and extinction of many birds of prey um, across Britain during the 18th and 19th century. And sadly, eagles, both eagles were wiped out of the Welsh landscape um, by 1860. And sadly, there's no other evidence to suggest any other reason other than persecution that was responsible for this. So the extinction of eagles in Wales was solely human mediated. Um, and we believe that we have a moral duty to restore them. And this moral duty fits into multiple um, government objectives restoring native lost species, for example, restoring um, ecosystem functions and creating sustainable and eco-resilient um, habitats as well across Wales. However, this is not the main question. The main question is whether historic persecution has reduced or been eliminated. And we can say that it has, especially in Wales, you only have to take a look at our widespread buzzard and red kite populations to understand that pers historic persecution has declined. Also, more importantly, if we take a look at our rarer species and the natural colonization of ospreys and hen harriers and the recent um, increase in our goshawk populations, provides irrefutable evidence that there's a positive change in attitudes towards birds of prey in Wales. <clears throat> However, because this is happening in Wales, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's happening across the rest of Britain. And this comes down to our next question. So the distribution, <coughs> excuse me, distribution and abundance of eagles in Britain and why they are still considered rare birds here. So the both, both golden and white-tailed eagle breeding populations are limited to the northern parameters of Scotland and Ireland. And there's a very different story for both species. The white-tailed eagles, um, white-tailed eagles were wiped out the whole of Britain, um, sadly, by the 19, 1918. And the first release happened on the Isle of Rum in the 1970s. And a rolling scheme of reintrodu reintroductions have helped this species become restored on the west coast of Scotland, also now the east coast as well, um, Killinary National Park in Ireland, and more recently um, they've been restored to the Isle of Wight in southern Scotland. So there's now believed to be 106 pairs of white-tailed eagles on the west of Scotland um, over a 50-year period, 10 pairs in Ireland after a 12-year period, and it's going to take about six years for a breeding population to be established in southern Scotland. So with golden eagles, they survived extinction in Britain. A small population was founded in North Scotland in the, in the late 19th century, or is it the early 19th century? And um, this is their conservation and protection measures um, have given rise to the population today. So there's now believed to be 508 pairs in, in quite similar ranges to white-tailed seagulls, but obviously coming and ranging inland as well. 
Um, golden eagle reintroductions, however, are very novel compared to white-tailed seagull reintroductions. The first reintroduction happened in Donegal National Park in the early, well, early 2001. Um, and there's now believed to be between one, three, one to three breeding pairs um, after a 12 year period. And re quite recently, there's been a top up scheme to the south of Scotland with hope that they, they, they come down um, south. So because of the limited distribution and population numbers, they are still considered as rare birds. But why haven't they colonised southern Britain yet? It's been 50 years since white-tailed eagles were released and much, much longer since golden eagles were heavily concerned, uh, conserved. So what's going on? So it comes down to the biology of the species. So both species are long-lived species. They also have um, slow population growth rates. They also have um, long sexual maturity as well. So they don't sexual mature, mature until the age of five um, and then enter the breeding population. So within the first five years of their life, they are extremely nomadic and they come into a lot of environmental um, problems, which increases their mortality rate. But the main, one of the main reasons is the fact that they have a life trait, which is called natal philopatry, meaning that when they reach the age of five and they enter the breeding population, they will breed, they were more likely breed in close proximity to their natal areas, um, meaning that their population um, growth is even smaller. So that's one of the main reasons why they haven't colonized southern Britain. But in the case of golden eagles, we have an extra factor to take into consideration. And this is persecution. So there's a number of um, persecution hotspots across um, Scotland and northern England, which causes ecological barriers which influence the distribution and abundance. So it's believed that it's around about 40 to 60 eagles are killed every year. Um, so this is obviously, um, you know, one a factor which is influencing the distribution as well. And what we've found is with all of these attributes taken into consideration, there is little possibility for, for, of natural colonisation of eagles to whales um, to the near future. And we're talking about 50 to 100 years. Um, so we believe because of all of these these factors that uh, reintroduction to whales would be the most acceptable option for the conservation of British eagles. So it comes on to our next question, if I can get my slides away. What do we need to consider about the Welsh landscape? So before we considered modern whales, we had to fill in a knowledge gap about where eagles were formally distributed. And formal distribution of eagles in Britain has been well studied by Derek Yaldin and Richard Evans, um, but there was a big knowledge gap for whales. So Welsh eagle history has always been a mystery to Welsh ornithologists. Originally, we only had 25 eagle records, um, and that was simply not enough to feed into a reintroduction. You know, we couldn't provide, that was not enough evidence to suggest that they're the widespread species um, and wouldn't definitely wouldn't have passed the license. Um, so we decided to fill in this gap by using Welsh resources. We looked at place names incorporating the, um, the, the Welsh word for eagle, which is a rare. Um, we looked at archaeological records, we looked at museum specimens, historic persecution accounts and historic ornithological literature as well. And we have now got a sufficient data set of 166 records, 85 for golden eagles and 77 for white-tailed eagles. So as you can see, um, we have records for each species across every county, which allows us to um, includes that they were widespread species across Wales. And we also know from archaeological findings that these species dated back to 
to the Devensian and Neolithic periods over 4,500 years ago. So they were here in prehistory as well. Um, also from place name evidence, we found that they, they, are, they are incorporated in place names right across Wales, which allows us to suggest that they're actually quite important to our heritage and culture here as well. So with this evidence, we can now safely say that we're aiming for a mitigation reintroduction, which means that we are able to restore eagles within their native ranges and have a range of sele you know, selection across Wales. Um, so, so what about suitable breeding habitat? So one of um, <clears throat> the IUCN guidelines um, and NRW requirements suggest that you need to provide evidence of how much suitable habitat is available for eagles to occupy. So what we did is we were working with um, eagle experts to map nest sites up in Scotland. We then extracted or had a look at habitat characteristics around those nest sites and mapped similar habitat characteristics across Britain. So what these maps tell us is how the species distribution or, or what the species distribution could look like if we had a full British eagle population. So the red, the red areas show high, um, you know, suitable habitat and the blue regions show, show that they're not suitable whatsoever. So as you can see, Scotland holds the highest proportion of eagle habitat in Britain. Um, from golden eagles, we know that you know, they've been topped up to the south of Scotland. There's a lot of habitat there. Also coming down into um, the northern England and the Peak District as well. And as you can see, Wales has the second highest proportion of suitable habitat. So for golden eagles, we can safely say that Wales um, is the next priority area for a restoration. And for white-tailed eagles, um, very, very similar. Um, there's a lot of coastlines, for example, Isle of Wight is highly suitable, so we know that's good um, Good for the, the recent releases. And we also know that Wales is the only country now without, um, without white-tailed seagulls. Um, so we can confidently say that for both species, Wales would be the next priority area. So what does this look like? Regionally, so this is what our suitable habitat looks like for golden eagles. It surprised me when we first mapped this because we have quite a lot of um, unfragmented habitats um, in North, Scot uh, North Scotland, North Wales, and um, the Cambria Mountains as well. And for white-tailed seagulls, we have a lot of um, coastal areas, Isle of Anglesey, Maudach, and the Duffy, um, Pembrokeshire. There's quite a lot of habitat here. So when we've calculated the proportion of this, um, 46% of the terrestrial surface is coming up as suitable for golden eagles. And for white-tailed eagles, 39%. Um, and the reason why this is a lower percentage is because there's less inland areas um, for white-tailed seagulls, you know, three kilometres from lakes, for example, rather than a whole mountain range for a golden eagle. So what these species distribution models have allowed us to do is set the basis of our license and feasibility studies. So what I mean by this is that we have allocated zones of priority across Wales. So for golden eagles, we've got 12 um, regions of or upland regions of focus where we're now gathering um, regional <coughs> evidence. We're also looking at lowland whales as well. And for white-tailed seagulls, obviously, we've got 14 areas of coastal priorities. We've also had a, um, we're also gathering evidence for inland areas as well. And what we've done is we've um, proof-checked our, our modern or suitable habitat then with our historic, um, historic um records as well and as you can see most of these records lie within suitable habitat um current suitable habitat so um oh let me go back so what do we need to consider about the welsh landscape so we're going to focus on golden eagles here so like i said we've got 12 areas of um, prior, um priority for golden eagles in wales 
But the proportion of suitable habitat doesn't mean that it's available for eagles to occupy today. And that is simply because of modern day land uses and perils from people. So one of um, the IUCN requirements and NRW requirements is to assess um, the proportion of available habitat um, in regards to land use compatibilities and risks that you know eagles may come into um, when they're released. So we've done a number of assessments um, to look at environmental suitability. So we've looked at livestock pasture. So just to mention uh, moving forward, that most of our feasibility studies are in this structure. Um, so what this map um, allows us to do is have a look at the intensity of livestock pasture across Wales. Um, we've calculated the proportion here in, um, of livestock pasture in each biogeographic region. And then we've allocated a rank score to pick out, you know, the areas which have less pasture and the areas that have more pasture. Um, and obviously, livestock pasture is one of the biggest land uses across Wales. It covers 75% of the terrestrial surface. Um, and what livestock pasture can do, especially in upland habitats, um, is reduces that um, upland kind of mosaic shrubland into grass species, especially if the area has been historic grazed, which changes the quality um, of eagle habitat, but also changes the composition of dietary requirements as well. So this is something that obviously is part of our feasibility studies and, and something that we've taken into consideration. Another land use or modern land use that we've taken into consideration is commercial conifer plantations. And this is something that's transformed much of Britain across the 19, uh, well, yeah, much of Britain in the 19, since the 1950s, really. And what this does is it changes open habitat, which is a preferred um, choice for eagles, um, into these dense closed canopy um, forests, which then allows um, it to become difficult to breed and hunt in. So what we've done for our assessments is we've considered the amount of historic habitat which has been lost to commercial forestry plantations. Another land use, oh, well, not, well, another land use that we've taken into consideration is the shooting industry. We don't have many game shoots in Wales, and they are mostly pheasants. So there's probably 55, mostly scattered um, in northeast Wales, and we'll come to that later on in the talk. But persecution is from 2007 to 2019. There's been 85 recorded raptor persecution incidents in Wales. And that is not a lot compared to England, which are on 750, and um, Scotland, which are around, I think, 450 now. So what persecution does is not only provides direct mortality to the species, to eagles, but it also displaces eagles as well. So from these 85 records, um, as you can see, most of, well, most of them have is just associated to one. 22 of these incidents are associated to one estate in Brecon Beacons. So as you can see here that Snowdonia is 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 free of, of um free of persecution, most of the Cambrian Mountains as well, and Thin Cummer. And that's interesting to note here that that's where our rarest species are distributed. So our ospreys are distributed here and also our hen harriers. But also persecution um, across lowland areas is much less than upland habitats. Um, and yeah, that we have a really rich population of um, peregrines. So these ecological species have allowed us to really look into regional areas a little bit more. So along with um, land use intensity, we've also had a look at historic habitat loss. Um, so urban areas, um, cover 4% of Wales, more 60% is just within S South Wales. Um, so what we've done is, so golden eagles would never breed anywhere close to urban areas or towns and cities. So what we've done is we've had a look at global research and the, the dis displacement buffers that these towns and cities would, would create. And we've calculated then the proportion of suitable habitat lost to um, urban areas across Wales. 
We've also done this for wind farms. Um, wind farms um, across Scotland, especially anything over six wind turbines, evidence shows that it can displace um, eagles, um, especially golden eagles, up to four kilometres. So what we've done is we've also had a look at, so we've mapped um, wind farms across, and wind turbines across Wales and calculated the proportion of habitat loss to these modern day land uses. And we've also had a look at resource availability as well. So for both species, we've, and this is just for golden eagles, but we've mapped uh, potential nest sites that are available. So as you can see, Snowdonia, it has more nest sites for golden eagles, um, also the Fangolfen and Berwyn ranges and the Cambrian mountains. Um, and the Brecon Beacons holds quite a few nest sites as well. Um, we've also had a look at, and I realise there's no key to this, but what these orange zones mean are they're just protected areas. So we've had a look at how much eagle habitat is in already protected areas in Wales, and this will help us work with stakeholders and national parks moving forward. So we've got quite a comprehensive picture um, of the environmental feasibility of both species. So this is what the historic um, land lo loss looks like. Um, so for golden eagles, you can now see if we take in, um, in consideration habitat loss, it's now starting to become extremely fragmented um, and it's not as much suitable habitat as our original maps show. Um, so we've found that 5.3% of um, historic habitat has been lost to modern day land uses in Wales um, and 4.9% for white as seagulls. And as you can see, um, there's, there's fragmentary habitat inland, but we are mostly going to concentrate on um, re-establishing coastal, you know, a breeding population across coastal Wales. So when we take this into consideration, 41.7% of Wales is still available for golden eagles to occupy, although it is fragmentary. And for white-tailed seagulls, 31, uh, 35.1 percent, sorry, but that's the whole terrestrial surface. But we're only, like I said, looking to restore breeding populations in coastal habitat. So um, 45 percent of our coasts then um, are suitable or available for eagles to occupy today. So we've shown you them in, in map, map formats, but what does this look like when we put, um, put it into a table and put them all together? So it tells a very um, cohesive story. So we've got our biogeographic zones of focus here. We've got our suitable habitat from our species distribution models, our habitat loss, our land use intensity in each of these regions, our available habitat left and our resource availability. We've then ranked obviously each area from best to worst habitat. So if we extend these colours across, you can still see that there's quite a lot of fragmentary habitats, but the, these green zones here are what we're interested in. So these are our best golden eagle habitats in regards to land use compatibility. So if we look at number one here, we can see the Central Snowdonia National Park. Um, oh, Central Snowdonia National Park is the best golden eagle habitat, um, followed by um, Black Mountains and Hay or Y. So they're small regions of Wales. Um, also Lower Snowdonia National Park and Upper Snowdonia National Park as well. And the Cambrian Mount Mountains is coming up within the top seven. So as you can see, um, fragmentary habitat available. But when we take a look at white-tailed seagulls, it looks a lot different. So in a very similar format, obviously, to the, the golden eagle tables. But if we start extending our colours across, you can now start seeing that we have this big chunk of coastline that comes up highly compatible for white-tailed seagulls. So from, um, from Isle of Anglesey, yeah, from Isle of Anglesey all the way down to Pembrokeshire National Park. You know, we've got the Duffy, Maudach, Peridigion, um, 
Glass Lynn as well and the Slim Peninsula, there's quite a big chunk of habitat that's still available and compatible for, uh, for white-tailed eagles to occupy today. So what about prey availability? So we're going to hit upon um, the concerns of, that people have. Um, so obviously over the last three years, we've been working with stakeholders and speaking to communities um, lightly. Um, and we've come across that there are a lot more concerns for golden eagles than there are for white tailed eagles. So just to kind of address these concerns, um, so both species are extreme generalists and both species occupy a wide variety of habitats and have a wide array of prey items. The diet composition varies across the globe. Um, in Scotland, um, the diet composition is normally made up around 1,700 prey items for golden eagles and 1,000 prey, prey items for white-tailed seagulls. And we believe that golden eagles have much more prey items because they have um, lower wing loadings and they can chase. And it's, it's different in um, kind of hunting strategy. So a, a pursuit hunter has access to a, a more variety of prey items. Than, than the white seagull. Dietary needs. So um, some people come to me and say, you know, if we release these birds, you know, they're going to just eradicate our, um, our current biodiversity. And that's not the case at all. These are not greedy species. They don't even eat every day. Um, you know, they, they, yeah, and even the success rate of hunting is very low. It's only 22%. Um, so with golden eagles, um, it's been suggested that they need about 250 grams of food per day. So to put that into perspective for you, that's the weight of a small hamster. And white-tailed eagles need slightly more food in a day. So they're probably about 600 grams of food. Um, so if you think of a 500 gram bag of uh, a small bag of sugar, um, so that's basically what a golden eagle, a uh, white-tailed eagle, sorry, needs in a day. And also, um, the carrying capacity has been brought up quite a lot as a concern as well. These birds aren't dangerous birds. They're not going to take your chihuahuas. They're not going to take your children. Um, these birds um, typically, you know, prey weighs about half of the size of uh, the weight of the bird. So for golden eagles, prey weigh between one to two kilograms. So to put that into perspective, two one litre bottles of water. And for white-tailed eagles, between one and five kilograms. Um, so five kilograms is, is the weight of a small dumbbell. So we do have um, quite, we have less concerns for white-tailed seagull prey availability than we do golden eagle. And we'll go into that now slightly in a bit. But before we go into um, our research into um, prey availability for both species, um, I would like to address one concern that comes up quite a lot um, <clears throat> and that is simply the diet of golden eagles in Scotland. Um, most people come to me and they say you know these birds mostly eat red grouse, um, red deer and mountain hares in Scotland. That is certainly the case and you're more than right to have your concerns because that was my concerns when I first started as well. But these so what's in um, so the diet of golden eagles in Scotland are very 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 broad and the composition depends on the area of where these birds are breeding. So, for example, that typical diet of grouse and mountain hares and red deer are normally found in inland regions where those prey species are more dense. Um, when you take a look at Watson's study, for example, in Whitfield's, um, Whitfield's study, they suggest that golden eagle diets vary across regions of Scotland. So as you come to the course, they more heavily rely on carrion, rabbits and seabirds, for example. Um, and yeah, so basically, um, Whitfield suggests that it's, there's no typical diet for golden eagles whatsoever. It is a consequence of prey availability. So even neighbouring nest sites um, differ, you know, between diet composition. But we do have our concerns for golden eagle prey in Wales. Um, and we'll come into this now. So if we look into um, European golden eagle diets, most of their 
diets, 90% actually are rabbits and pheasants and partridges. Um, so if we take a look at um, rabbit and hay distribution across Wales and game bird distribution across Wales, it starts telling us um, a, a, a very different story. So with rabbit and hay populations, they're a lot more dense across um, lowland Wales. And as you come into upland Wales, they get less dense. So there are small pockets of areas where golds and eagles may settle and have enough sufficient prey. But in some areas and most areas across um, Wales, our upland habitats are not of quality and certainly need a lot more work um, and a lot more consideration. And for game species, you know, it's a reflection of um, land use as well. So most of our game species are distributed where our shooting states are. Um, and that then obviously could bring, bring more problems to golden eagles via persecution. So what we've done is we've had, we've mapped, and this has taken us a while um, to do this, is ha we've had a look at prey densities across Wales um, for, for dietary requirements. These numbers probably don't mean anything to you, so I'm going to try to explain them through the hierarchy system that we've created. So what our red regions mean is that they are areas with less uh, dense densities of prey and our green regions here obviously are our habitats with more prey for golden eagles. So as you can see um, our lowlands, our lowlands um, carry more prey than, than upland habitats. Um, also central um, and upper Snowdonia National Park is also coming up as green and the Cambrian Mountains as well is coming up um, as sufficient prey base. Um, but as you can tell, like our land use data, these are very fragmentary um, in comparison to white-tailed seagulls. Um, and I'll show you what white-tailed seagulls look like. So they have a lot you know, more bird species incorporated into their diet. Um, but when we have a look at our hierarchy system, you can start seeing that there is a lot more green zones across Wales, especially along our coastlines, which hold, um, you know, sufficient prey base for white-tailed seagulls. Um, so Isle of Anglesey, it gets me really excited when we talk about Isle of Anglesey and white-tailed seagulls. Um, but Isle of Anglesey is coming up at the top, um, top for prey. Um, also, the Pembrokeshire National Park is coming up as the second, I think, I believe, yeah. And then um, you've got the likes of Maudach and Duffy and the Glasslin areas as well, which all hold sufficient prey. And also, quite surprisingly, the Gower Peninsula has got, got quite a, a good uh, prey base for white-tailed seagulls. So we've got a lot more habitats to select from. So what about our best? So putting these um, land use or environment and biological assessments together, We've now been able to pick out, pick out the best eagle habitats across Wales to start focusing more on regional assessments. So, as you can see here, for, um, for golden eagles in particular, Central Snowdonia National Park is our best eagle habitat, um, golden eagle habitat in Wales, um, followed by Upper Snowdonia National Park and also um, the Cambrian Mountains as well. So we've got three areas of focus um, for golden eagles. Um, but with white-tailed seagulls, we've got a lot more um, areas to select from. So as you can see, we've got five areas here. So the, the, with land use compatibility and prey availability put together, Isle of Anglesey is coming up on top. Um, one of our top eagle habitats, followed by the Glasslin, Maudach, the Fiestri, and also Pembrokeshire National Park as well. Um, so in regards to both species, you know, our evidence shows that white-tailed eagles would be more compatible. Both species are viable to restore in Wales, but it will take a lot longer for golden eagles. And that comes down to our last question, 
when will a reintroduction happen? And like I started my talk, there's been a lot of ludicrous time frames thrown around in the media recently, you know, saying that this is going to happen next year. It's not going to happen next year. And I can tell you why it's not going to happen next year. We've been gathering three years of feasibility studies. Um, if we put our license application on NRW's desk now, they would decline it because there's just not enough evidence there. So to turn this around in a year is, is yeah, it's, it's, it's just ridiculous. But if you take a look at evidence, so in regards to successful reintroduction um, biologists, um, especially with eagles across Britain, these programs take around six to seven years. And that is because we're binded by restrictions. It's not as easy as what most people make out. Um, also, you know, we are on track to meet this target. Um, we're, 50, we're three years in now, we're 50% through our feasibility studies. Um, we have been set back slightly because of the pandemic. Um, but yeah, we, we, we're on track to get to make this happen within within the expected time frame we will be starting with white tail seagulls um and that is evident hopefully from obviously our evidence that, that have gathered and i've spoken to a lot of people over the years you know and they they have no doubts about white tail seagulls um but we are not giving up on golden eagles at all it will take longer because that we, we have we do have a lot more concerns and our research can help guide, obviously, focus, focusing on our upland habitat and biodiversity, obviously working with Welsh government and authority figures. Um, and that is needed, obviously, in order to restore these species. So what are our next steps? So our next step are to complete regional analysis now for our potential release sites across Wales. So we've picked out the best eagle habitats. So now we will just obviously start doing regional analysis. Um, you know, we've we've done most of our analysis. We just need to start looking at um, tourism and and um, stakeholders that we need to contact in those regions, and obviously communities as well. We also need to, to complete habitat regulatory assessments, which basically, like our prey data, we need to now start splitting them into winter and summer diets. We need to start looking at how, uh, species. That could be a potential risk, especially protected species across our coastlines or inland habitats. Um, and that's extremely important um, as, as IUCN criteria. Obviously, a big chunk of any reintroduction work, it was definitely the case in Ireland, it was definitely the case in south of Scotland, and definitely the case in Scotland as well, where these birds were first released. Working with communities and stakeholders is the most time consuming part and the most important part as well of any reintroduction programme. And also, we've already started dialogue with potential release schemes here in Wales. Um, we've just recently come back from Norway, um, well, say recently last year. Um, you know, we're in, we've been in talk with um, South of Scotland as well about translocation methods. So we will now start working, you know, with our data and how and how the best translocation methods could be for whales. Um, and that comes to the end of our talk. So, yeah, thank you very much. Diochen Baron Randall, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd just like to thank the Royal Society of Biology as well for hosting this talk. I really appreciate it. Um, and before really we go, we... The RW project is now at jeopardy of not having a full-time researcher. Um, and that's before the pandemic, um, we had funding and a job position for the Wildlife Trust Wales as Eagle Project Manager. But obviously during the pandemic and during lockdown, um, the funding obviously wasn't available anymore. And so was, you know, that and the job wasn't available anymore either. So it was our last resort, really, asking for public money. It wasn't in our plan at all. But obviously, during the pandemic, government and conservation funds are not open until um, April next year. Um, so we really need um, as much support as we can. We've got a week left on our crowdfund. Um, so hopefully, if, if you are able to, it's a very difficult time for many people even if you can donate, we'd really appreciate it. Um, 
And also, if you can share our crowdfunder as well, if you go on to our website, Eagle Reintroduction Wales or our social media accounts, even just share them around. We'd really appreciate if you can spread the word widely. We've now got six six days left to raise a 25 grand target. So, yeah, we'd really appreciate your support. But, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Hopefully we've, um, you know, kind of addressed your concerns um, over over this talk as well. And we'll open up now to questions as well. Yeah, hi, Sophie. Thank you for that. Um, we've got quite a few questions in here, but I'm quite conscious that one of our audience tonight might have to be getting ready for bed soon. So this is from Oliver, age nine. What is the average lifespan of both eagles in the wild? Oh, good question. Average is probably probably 25 to 30 years. But for golden eagles, the longest lived species, uh, longest lived birds, I think, was tagged by Roy Dennis when he was um, when he was young, but also the eagle was young as well. He was found, I think, in 2018 and he was 36 years of age. So, yeah. OK, I hope that answers your question, Oliver. So the next one then is from Matthew Hopes. So what made it motivated you to undertake this project and how, sorry, and did your expectations at the start change as the project continued and finished? It's a good question. Um, what motivated me? Um, <laughs> I, like I said, I'm a bird of prey fanatic. I had the opportunity to work with Golden Eagles up in Scotland and was mentored by Roy Dennis. Um, and yeah, this opportunity just come about over a cup of tea with Roy Dennis, really. Um, I come home, I designed the project. Um, yeah, and yeah, we didn't think that it was a viable option as to start off with. I had a lot of concerns, especially for Golden Eagles um, when we started. But as we've gone along, obviously, and we've gathered regional evidence, you start, you know, yeah, we now know that it's viable to restore the species which three years ago, we didn't even know we, you know, that it was our main objective to, you know, by the time we finished this, this PhD program to know whether it's, it was viable. And yeah, it certainly is viable. So it definitely has changed. Yeah. Okay. And then we've got another one now from Heather. How do these two eagles fit in the overall prey species, especially red kites, which have been a successful introduction over the last 30 years across Wales and the UK and Ireland, will they compete for food? That's a good question. So every bird of prey has, a, um, you know, um, a role in the environment. You know, most, you know, most, well, Scotland is a good example. Most of these birds, you know, um, they have a full birds of prey, you know, all of their birds of prey up in Scotland. And they all hold kind of different niches within the environment. Um, you know, so we do white tailed eagles. A lot of people ask us whether they have would have an influence, for example, on um, ospreys. Um, but no, we don't think they'd have a detrimental impact on birds of prey. What what we can say, though, is that, you know, our buzzard and red, red kite populations are really really abundant across wales and you know um their population they inhabit like um habitats that they're not supposed to be in um so what eagles would do is start um start reducing those populations down slightly um but they won't have a detrimental detrimental effect at all to birds of prey Okay, great. And then another one, uh, the decline of common prey such as rabbit fluctuation due to disease and loss of hairs across a similar period must have had an impact. Has this been analysed too? Um, what, do you, what do you mean, like with, um, with the disease or, or, or with prey densities? Prey densities and as a result of disease. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we will be, obviously we've only had a look so far at mammals and bird species and um, for rabbits you know we do understand and like i said for golden eagles in particular these um the upland prey densities of rabbits are, are and hares are of concern and obviously you know we're not going to turn a blind eye now to these diseases that are you know um that are going through these populations um 
But yeah, so we are, we are definitely we have taken it into consideration, and we are obviously doing further assessments, obviously for golden eagles, um, in order to, you know, understand whether they can be restored to our uplands. But we do know that there are, and and probably the mammal society as well has got research on this, and um, that our populations in lowland areas for rabbits in particular are much much more dense than in our upland habitats. Okay, great. And that's, uh, that leads on to a similar question. Um, so this is from Murray, who actually is an old owner of a golden eagle and has bred two himself. Um, mm -hmm. He's watched wild eagles many times in the wild and he read Jet Watson's studies of goldies and concentrates his question on this data. Scotland has 200,000 red deer with a resulting carrion and winter mortalities. Scotland has mountain hares, red grouse, Wales has no alternative to these prey items. The wild rabbit population has been disseminated by BHD um, and he doesn't believe that there's sufficient prey items for golden eagles in mm -hmm. Wales. Yeah, and we've, we've already addressed that in, in, in the talk, haven't we? We were saying that they do have a broad array of dietary requirements. But for example, you know, if, if we were going to release golden eagles in Wales, they would have very similar diets to coastal white uh, coastal golden eagles or their European relatives, um, and ninety percent of European um, golden eagles occupy you know I have um, you know their diet is rabbits and pheasants, but in our upland habitats we don't have those. So this is why we're saying that it needs to be more of a considerate approach for golden eagle reintroductions here in Wales. Yeah. Okay, and this one's from Dan. Uh, Dan's an independent consultant um, and all for eagle reintroduction. Um, looking at your maps on distribution, um, he thinks that Cornwall's being left out a little bit. Cornwall? <laughs> I yeah, for white tailed eagles, because he thinks that's a suitable habitat, but the density on your one of your slides there didn't sort of depict that. Oh, I don't know. No, I don't know. Should I go back? Yeah, if you could do. What what map are we talking about? It was the initial uh, population densities you had for the two species. Um, nope. Let's have a look. <laughs> um, not not these maps. No, it was the one for the UK wide, which showed. Oh, right. okay. Yeah, I know which ones you're talking about now. Sorry, I'm going to go back all the way back through. So these maps? Yeah. So for the white tailed, you have Cornwall as mainly all blue, but he thinks that there is sustainable prey there for. I see, them. Yeah, I see, I see what you mean. This is not assessing prey, this is assessing suitable habitat. Is that, is that what that means? Yeah, he thinks because of the prey with fish and what have you around Cornwall that it would be a suitable habitat as well yeah, as the, the cliffs. Yeah, with, with Whitefield's eagle maps, because this is obviously a wide British scale, um, if you zoomed in to obviously the Cornwall area, it would be com coming up with, um, you know, obviously red or, or different pixels. These maps are 50 kilometre um, 50 kilometer squared. So these are fine resolution maps. So if you zoomed in, which I can't obviously now with this talk, but if, yeah, if you zoomed in on Cornwall, then yeah, there probably would be sufficient prey and food base for them. And I think white-tailed seagulls um, down in England have been using Cornwall as well at the minute, haven't they? They've been settling in those regions, which then again, you know, like Dan said, provides evidence of, you know, that is suitable for them. Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. Um, I'm just trying to go through some more questions now. Okay, this is from Murray. The 12 areas you have identified, he would have grave concerns about areas 9, 10 and 11 as it's played by tourism and hill walkers. Yes. 500,000 visitors alone up Snowdon. So he doesn't think that Goldies would tolerate this kind of type of disturbance. And area 7 has been described by George... Monbate as a sheep infested wildlife desert. Yeah. Um, areas one, two, and three, no space for goldies. 
One, two, three. Well, yeah, this is what this is what we've said throughout the talk, isn't it? You know, with with it with the lowland um, with one, two, and three, obviously they're highly densely populated. With our golden eagle habitats, you know, we've got the three best areas in regards to um, environmental and biological feasibility is coming up as middle um, central Snowdonia, upper Snowdonia and Cambrian Mountains. Well, if you take a look at those three areas, Murray's right in every way with what he's saying. The upper Snowdonia, obviously, you know, these are part of our regional assessments now, obviously, you know, take a look going forward. I think everybody understands that, you know, these areas are, you know, have a lot of tourist capacity, um, especially upper Snowdonia. Um, so, yeah, this is something that obviously, you know, we will be looking into further when we start zooming in now on these three, three, three kind of regions for golden eagles. Okay, and then uh, from Laura, would there be an effect on kites and buzzards if eagles, and are the eagles likely to visit kite feeding stations? It's a good question. So yeah, they do have, like I said earlier, they do have something that's called um, a maze. Well, if eagles were restored, they would um, have something called like a mesopredator release effect. So populations which are overpopulated, like red kites and buzzards. Um, so if you take a look at buzzard populations, for example, they inhabit every habitat across Wales. We've done, we've done assessments on this as well. Up in Scotland, for example, they're only restricted to certain areas, and that's because they've got, um, you know, golden eagles, which obviously displace them slightly. And that would happen in Wales. Um, you know, if we released um, golden and white-tailed eagles, you know, it, we start getting more balanced systems. They start, you know, instead of being overpopulated, they would actually be to the carrying capacity of Wales rather than obviously being, you know. And they, and in regards to eagles, I don't know any um, examples. I, mean, I think I've spoken to this about uh, with somebody recently. Any examples of any eagles in feeding stations at all golden eagles you know definitely not white tail seagulls i'm not i'm not really sure i've not heard of any um i've not heard of any being in any feeding stations uh so so yeah it's definitely an interesting question okay and this is from alexander um so are you seeing any trends with raptor persecution so i.e is it regularly being committed by the same people are there any wildlife crime initiatives in this area to try and increase surveillance or accurately disrupt offence uh, disrupt offences being committed? And does this risk of persecution factor into your reintroduction planning? Yes. Um, so across Wales, um, you know, like I said, there, there are hot spots. Obviously, <laughs> um, I'm not going to name them. And there are hot spots, but we do we do have our concerns in Wales because, you know, even though there's not a lot of recorded um, recorded kind of persecution incidents, they are associated, uh, you know, to certain activities in certain regions. Um, also, you know, there is a massive not you know in Wales, there is no population monitoring of our raptors at all but um, our raptor monitoring scheme closed down in 2013 um, and it's sad really you know because these birds of prey you know are you know the red kite is our our national treasure here in Wales you know and they're not being monitored um, so yes and no really um, you know we we do think that they probably can be increased an increased effort here for to record raptor persecution um, yeah so Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, I'll just do one more and then I'm going to hand over to Claire to ask a few. Um, so rabbit populations are falling in many areas, as you've already said, but would this have an, an impact on long-term reintroductions and sustainability? Yes, um, and this is quite an important question, actually, because, we're, you know, part of, these, part of this programme is it's a long-term commitment. So... You know, it means that if the if, even if the conditions are right now and they start changing in due course, um, you know, we part of these programs needs um, long term post release management strategies, and this is why these you know programs take such a long time to to launch. 
to gather the evidence, you know, to make sure that everything's right. And then to make sure that you've got obviously structure for a post-release monitoring as well. You know, so it's, it's in our objectives, really. You know, if things start to, start to change, um, then, you know, we would have that, that post-release monitoring scheme put in place, obviously, you know, and a team in place then to work with these birds. Um, it's a full-term commitment. Hi, it's Sophie Lee. Hi. Um, so the qu next question is from Ian, and he says, if, and it's a big if, persecution ended would they colonize naturally and if so how long would it take um that's a good question so if persecution didn't exist um for golden eagles then golden eagles may may be um you know kind of may have you know colonized southern wales um it's really hard to say but like i said it's not only persecution that restricts their distribution um you know they are like i said slow slow population growth because of the life biology anyway um so we can't it's really difficult question to answer you know how long would it take to colonize the whole of uh, whole of southern britain if it wasn't for persecution um persecution doesn't you know for golden eagles it affects them significantly because obviously they overlap with driven grouse moors but for white-tailed eagles it's not it, there was one um there was one found you know uh, this year that that kind of um caused a storm it's really sad um but yeah so for for white tails they they're, they're restricted you know because of their life biology for golden eagles you know i think that they probably would if it wasn't for persecution they would have been you know they would have at least been in northern england by now i think um definitely yeah um, the next question is from Heather, and she asks, why were the Black Mountains discounted for Golden? Black Mountains? Yes. Oh, right, okay. And um, because it was, is because of this, <laughs> this is a good question, because it's a small area, um, and also because it's so close to the English borders. Um, so obviously, if we were going to restore a Golden Eagle population on the English borders, you know, we would have to kind of do, you know, we'd have to do full scale feasibilities for England as well. Um, so that's the kind of we know that it could probably hold a population there, um, especially, you know, um, foraging areas for youngsters, for example. Um, but yeah, but for for a release program in Wales, um, you know, they would hold these birds, but we probably wouldn't look to release them there. So the next question is. The Red Kite Project in Wales has had a remarkable success. Do you have similar hopes for the Golden slash White-tailed Eagle project? We do have high hopes for White-tailed Eagle reintroductions in Wales. Yeah, uh, for Golden Eagles, like I said, we do have our concerns at the minute, but we're willing to, you know, we're willing to keep working on on that. Um, you know, we're working with a with a with a fragmented hab habitat for Golden Eagles. Um, but we do have high hopes for white-tailed seagulls. Yeah, we do. We hope, you know, hopefully like the rest of white-tailed seagull reintroductions across uh, Britain that we can be branded just as success successful as them. So Theo, age 10, so we get home quick just before you guys to go to bed, hopefully. Where were white-tailed eagles first discovered? Oh, <laughs> that's a very broad question. Uh, first discovered... <laughs> well, how about I say where the last white-tailed eagle was in Wales? That's 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 probably a more intriguing question. Um, the last white-tailed eagle nest was in um, there's two there's two on our records. One was in Kenfig Burrows in the 19, uh, in the 1830s, and there was also one on the Thin Peninsula as well in the um, in the 1860s, I believe. So yeah, um, where were they first discovered is a really good question. Probably one that's caught me out out of all of them. <laughs> right. And the next question is, what measures will be put in, into place to prevent persecution? Persecution, right. Um, so obviously the measures that we need to put in place initially before we release these birds is working with stakeholders. Um, and, you know, even though we've got a small um, 
a small kind of game shooting industry that is not the only stakeholders that we need to work with you know farmers um were you know correlated really to the extinction of these birds before so farmers would be a big you know um um stakeholders to work with um in in wales and especially because obviously it covers most of the land use as well um so yeah so it it would need the the mitigation measures would need to be put in place really before we release the birds it's always important you know the most important thing to consider here is the welfare of these species post release so so those mitigation strategies would have to be through stakeholder engagement Um, Heather asks, the white tails released in Isle of Wight were tracked over the northeast, so travel widely. So how mm-hmm. can you uh, be sure that the released birds don't set up elsewhere? That's a good that's a good point. So do you know when we were talking about natal philopatries, they have a commitment to um to their natal areas. So it's the same when you release um release eagles in a certain area they have a commitment to their release area so for example like the isle of wight if many of you are following they have a wide range but they always come back to the isle of wight so they at the minute so those eagles are finding pockets of food um temporary settlement areas they they've got about six or seven on average over their you know over the five years where they then kind of you know um fly in between um and then they will always come back to that to that um to that area um so yeah so that's how we know kind of, that's how we establish you know um an eagle population in wales then basically hmm. um, sam asks would the birds for the reintroduction program be taken from the scottish population or from further afield such as norway Good question. So for golden eagles, um, it would almost certainly be Scotland um, because obviously the, the population numbers um, also because of the conservation. Um, for white-tailed seagulls, we have the option for both Scotland and Norway. Um, we did have, before the pandemic, we were more leaning towards Norway. But that was just because of the financial um, circumstances were there in order for us to do that. Um, but yeah, so yeah, we could get white seagulls from Scotland or Norway, but for golden eagles, it would definitely be Scotland, yeah. Um, so Matthew asks, if eagles are successfully introduced, how long would you expect them to take to establish breeding populations? Um, so it's the same, really, about probably six, six to seven years Um Six, six years um you know so if for example we really we normally do a five-year release scheme where we release about 15 birds per year um and then you know after five-year periods on the sixth year we would expect probably about three to four breeding pairs by the seventh or eighth year 10 so it's a very slow progression we're not we're not releasing you know a big population we're establishing a small breeding population for both species um, Sean Rees says, um, great talk, thoroughly enjoyed. How would you plan on convincing the farming community of Wales that these eagles won't target their animals? It's a good question. And that's probably one of the, the, one of the ones I was waiting for. Um, so this, you know, this is a, an approach where we're like, you know, this is happening. We need a national Welsh effort here. And, this, and farmers are so important. So they're custodians of our, land, our rural landscapes. You know, they're also part of our culture and heritage, exactly the same as eagles. What we hope to do is we hope to work with farmers. We've got, you know, there's there's so many examples across the globe that these eagles, you know, are part of, you know, agricultural systems and agricultural areas. You know, there's a lot of mitigation strategies and decoy strategies, for example, that we can work with farmers um, to reduce, you know, land predation, if any, um, but yeah, it is a very vexed topic about uh, about lamb predation, you know. Um, most farmers think eagles are a menace, um, you know, and that's not particularly, that's particularly, like, that's not true at all. You know, these eagles, um, you know, lambs, they, lambs are taken by eagles, you know. Um, it's, you know, lambs remains in nests 
offers irrefutable evidence of this. But the main question is whether they take healthy, viable lambs. And there's evidence, you know, to say that um, eagles, you know, are, um, sorry, lambs have been taken live, um, you know, from talon and bruises. But then that that's not really reliable because what these species do is they take, you know, birds of prey in general are very good at picking out weak and injured animals. Um, so, so and, and on, on the plus side as well, you know, a lamb is three to five kilograms when it's born. So it's already reaching the carrying capacity of an eagle. Um, so there's so many, it's not the fact that these are going to provide risk to the lambs, it's the fact of how we can work together to, um, and we're not, you know, to, to work together to restore these species. Farmers would be a big part of our post-release um, post release mountain scheme. So it's how we work together moving forward. Um, we don't have concerns you know, eagles don't have a uh, eagles have a minimum impact on on um, livestock loss. Okay, and you said that we need a, a national effort. So I happen to have a question from Paul, who coincidentally is chair of National Parks Wales. Okay, I'd like to know what involvement have you had from the national parks? Right. Well. This is this is the thing, because over the last three years, we didn't really want to be in the public eye. That was not in, in intentions whatsoever. What we ideally wanted to do is gather this research behind the scenes. And then when we were ready to take the, the project, which we are now uh, to stakeholder um, and community engagement, we were then obviously going to launch it, launch it through the media. Obviously, for anybody who's following, that hasn't really happened. We've been forced to be in the media recently and over the last two years. So, um, you know, it is our plan to start working with, you know, we've spoke sporadically, informally to people, you know, just to kind of scout out their their opinions. Um, but, you know, when we get funding now to launch the next um, next phase or if we get funds in for the next phase then that's when we really put the effort in you know to start working with stakeholders okay great and i don't know if paul is interested in linking up with you but maybe he can share his email and oh, definitely get in touch with him with regards to getting involved with national parks yeah on our website you can get in contact with us um via the eagle reintroduction wales link so any questions anything that you have um, yeah, just get in contact with me and I, I'll be willing to talk to you. Yeah, definitely. And then with the farmers again, we have another one. Um, you said how you'd like to get the farming community on board, but how do you foresee doing this when the National Farmers Union policy is to oppose reintroduction of any species? Well, we've had we've had meetings with NFU. Um, they are happy with our slow and considered approach. Um, so, you know, we are. You know, if we start thinking negatively about this, um, you know, it's you know, it's not going to happen. We've had meetings with NFU. We've discussed what we're doing. We've we've discussed there's not going to be a kick you down, kick you door down approach. It never works with farmers. Never has anyway. Um, you know, we're willing to work and share knowledge and experience, you know, um, with farmers as well as, as many stakeholders across Wales, you know, to be the most fitting, fitting, you know, fitting strategy here. And, and, you know, they are big, important parts of our rural landscape. So, you know, we can't, you can't avoid them really, can we? We need them to be part of, part of this as a national effort. Okay, and a, an unrelated question now. This is from Bryony. She has an assignment to do on um, the pros and cons of reintroduction schemes. Mm -hmm. Are there any others of particular, others in particular that have come up for this project? Pros and cons, I think she means. Pros and cons. Um... Well, the pros are obviously, you know, using using our, our research, you know, to, in stakeholder meeting, providing visual aids to people rather than just talking about doing this without actually providing any of it. That's probably a pro for, you know, that's probably a, a, a you know, a, a good thing for us because people can actually see, you know, the capacity of what, what whales can, what whales can, you know, contribute to these birds. That's probably 
the biggest pro. Um, con, um, I can't think of any cons at the minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so Brian, you think along the lines of science communication. Science communication. Um, Addressing your audience. That was for, that was for Brian and Sophie, not for you. Sorry. Oh right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Would the reintroduction of eagles help the population growth of red red squirrels in Wales? It's known that goshawk and pine martin have a positive effect. Oh really? Okay, that's interesting. Um, I don't know whether eagles. Obviously, goshawks would be good predators of red squirrels because obviously they forest forestry species. Um, golden and white-tailed eagles, um, they can hunt in in forestry, but it's not you know they prefer open landscapes. So we don't really think they'd have really any effect on on red squirrel populations. Okay. Um... Given that eagles travel wildly, how concerned are you that they will venture into persecution hotspots in England, bearing in mind the recent issue in Wiltshire? Yes, um, that is part of our concern. Um, obviously, you know, these birds are wide ranging, you know, like Rory's birds now on the Isle of Wight, they're settling in in, in North Yorkshire Moors, not the greatest location. Um <laughs> But, you know, we, we can't control we can't control where these birds are going to go at all. But what you know, what we can do is, you know, that's that's why, for example, in Wales and for across any reintroduction program with these species that we would satellite tag them. So we know where they are at all times. And yeah, that would be part of our, you know, um, post release monitoring would be to, you know, to follow these birds like the Isle of Wight reintroduction. Okay, and a big plus would be the tourism um, it would bring to Wales, as it has in Mull. Could funding come from this part of the community, and have you looked into that? Um, yeah, so we've had meetings with Tourism Minister and Tourism Wales, um, but only for white-tailed seagulls, because I am strongly against using golden eagles for tourism, because they're just not a compatible species at all. Um so for white for white tail seagulls we have had a chat. They bring over five million pounds to mull every year. Um, you know, and white tailed eagles, like I said, are less less elusive species. They you know, they 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 don't really have much effect on, you know, they're not bothered by human much human activity anyway, or not as bothered as as golden eagles. So for white tailed seagulls we could, you know, could kind of, you know, go down the tourist route but um you know these, these reintroduction programs are not all you know it's we have to assess economic benefit as well but you know it's about it's about the restoring biodiversity and restoring um lost ecosystem functions but yeah i can see you know we've had we've had meetings with the tourism minister and they don't feel like we're at the right position to ask for funding yet um which is fair enough Okay, and this is from Ian. With two hen harriers going missing in northeast Wales and DGS set to start again at the same place, would this be a threat, especially to golden eagles? It's a good question because Wales has a really healthy um, hen harrier breeding population. Um, I think, I don't know, but last time I heard it was like 23, 23 breeding pairs. That's quite healthy. Um, considering, you know, not, you know, what's happening in North Yorkshire Moors. Um, unfortunately, yes, I, they, there was two, I think, found in Wrexham, um, or one found in Wrexham and one found, um, further south. Um, it is a concern. Obviously, persecution is going to be a big concern, obviously, but with, with, you know, with the natural colonization and our hen harriers doing well at the minute, um, you know, that, that gives us a lot of confidence, but, yeah, it would. It is definitely a concern. Yeah, for for golden eagles in particular. Yeah. Okay, and this one is from Tommy, age ten. So we're going to test your biological knowledge here. So, what is the difference between red kites and eagles biologically, from Tommy? Oh, gosh, right. Okay. Um, biologically. 
So eagles are much bigger species. So they um, they have white-tailed eagles have a eight-foot wingspan. Um, golden eagles have a six and a half foot wingspan. Is it so? Red cat no seven seven foot wingspan. Sorry, and uh, red red kites have a five foot wingspan. So the difference between the difference biologically between these species is that eagles are top order predators and red kites are meso predators. So um, so yeah, eagles are in control basically, and then you've got your meso predators like red kites, which are most yeah. That's probably all I can say with the biology of that. Okay, maybe you'll come across food webs in your science school, uh, lessons in school, Tommy. Thank you. <laughs> so um, what can we do to reduce persecution and decrease environmental mortality of young eagles? Um, what can we do? Well, like I said, again, that, that we answered that question with the stakeholder stuff, you know, the mitigation strategies before the release of these birds, need, you know, needs to be taken into consideration, you know, and then obviously continue working with stakeholders after as well, which would be, you know, that's 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 kind of all we can do um, you know, as, as, as myself and, um, you know, increase efforts really across Wales for birds of prey um, uh, monitoring as well. Yeah. Okay, and another question, as we're moving more towards green energy, which means that we have a larger number of wind turbines um, already covering a lot of the Welsh landscape, long term is surely going to have a huge effect on distribution, as you mentioned, this has already. Yes, um, that is true. Um, you know, a lot of wind, um, a lot, we've kind of had discussions with um, with Renewable Energy UK as well um, about this, um, most you know most wind farms now, um, which have been there for you know they're going in for relicenses, they're reducing the number of wind farms by increasing the size. So there's a, if we work with these, you know there's there's very a lot of good examples across the globe that we can start working with stakeholders and really start considering you know how we can create more. Uh, you know, an eco resilient, sustainable future for Wales. And this is what this is all about, isn't it? Is is to try to, you know, to work together, you know, to create the best future, you know, for for further generations. Um, you know, and 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 wind farms are a big problem. Um, but um from global evidence really you know it's upland wind farms for eagles especially golden eagles don't bring around a lot of problems um it's normally lowland wind farms because they can't get the 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 updrift to, to kind of fly over them um and in scotland you know um golden eagles just completely avoid wind turbines you know satellite tagged eagles i saw the maps in a conference last year and, you know, you've got wind farms and there's just no eagle activity whatsoever. Um, so, yeah, they, it would be a concern, of, obviously, if if the if wind farms were to increase. Um, but if they stayed the same as they are now or reduced, obviously, because of those license um, license changeovers, you know, then, yeah, we, we you know, the, yeah, we've already kind of put them into our assessments. So... Okay, and then uh, this question from Angela, but I think we've had a question about it in the chat as well, um, kind of related. So a new shoot has opened this week um, near McCuntleth called mm -hmm. W Falls. Um, 40,000 pheasants were released onto the estate. Mm -hmm. Will this be an area of particular concern now? And then the other question was um, with relation to driving shoot or driven shoots driven shoots yeah um How are you mitigating against that i didn't know about the new pheasant shoot did the, did, they, did you say in mccunflick and the duffy in mccunflick yeah that's interesting we'll have it we'll have a look into that and driven shoots um what was the question about driven shoots sorry um do you think that driven shoots will have an effect on a reintroduction programme? 
you need driven driven shoots you know like i said we haven't really got many we've got like sp- you know them sporadically distributed across wales compared driven shoots always provide a problem um you know for especially you know persecution of birds of prey it does increase the incentives to do it um but in regards to you know because obviously you know you know pheasants are natural prey species and there's obviously going to be a conflict isn't it so this is why you know like i say come back into to stakeholder meetings is extremely important so the next phase is really you know to gauge people's attitudes and 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 ex, you know especially within the game shooting industry for golden eagles that's something that you know you can't avoid really um especially as they're part of their natural prey base Okay, and uh, what is the survival rate of the birds? With some claims that it's in the eighty percent in Ireland. Um, yeah, those claims have not come by me or my team. Um, just to just to confirm that, um, um, the survival rates are normally around twenty two percent for for eagles. So twenty two percent of birds would reach five years of age and enter the breeding population. For example, you know, that's, it does vary. Um, so 22%, um, it's in some areas of Scotland for golden eagle. For white-tailed eagles, it can extend up to 40, 40%. Um, so it, on average, 30 to 40% of birds survive to a breeding age. Okay, and we've got a few questions now which are kind of related. So this is after a licence has been granted. So how will you carry out a release and then what will you do post release to monitor the birds and prevent them from nesting elsewhere oh that's a good question <clears throat> i don't think we would several questions <laughs> uh, i've forgotten the first one already um so how would we go about a reintroduction so uh, we would translocate the species from um so for example norway scotland and um, we'd get the, our licenses um, at the minute, um, are allowed to take youngsters from the nest site. So it would be wild released birds. So, for example, if we take Scotland, so we'd be taking young birds from Scotland. We'd be then putting them in soft release pens um, for about five to six weeks, I think. I, I think so. And then obviously um, we would, you know, let them get used to their surroundings um, and then we would release them out into the environment. We we'll probably supplementary feed them for the first six months over winter because that's the most um, vulnerable time for eagles, especially young eagles. And then obviously, you know, they kind of would, you know, kind of start wandering widely um, in order to, you know, to kind of, they always have a commitment anyway to their release sites, like I've said, but obviously to encourage eagles to breed, we'd start putting artificial nest sites up as well. Um, you know, so they would start becoming familiar then with, with, with those breeding areas. Okay, great. And so another question is, would interbreeding in the pop, small populations be an issue at all? In okay. terms of the health of the, the birds. It's between golden and white tailed eagles. Um, I'm not sure if they mean between interspecies or single species. Oh right, okay, I see what you mean now. Yeah. Um so we're very selective of where we get our birds from. Obviously we don't we're not allowed to take um so our license um, our license is to take eagles we can't we can only take eagles out of a nest if it's a twin or more you know for white eagles more than twin we can only take one and they uh, we can only take the smallest out of that so the so um so that kind of you know and then obviously so we never kind of release brothers and sisters you know if that makes sense so there would be no yeah so that yeah so we, there would be no kind of um inbreeding inbreeding or imprinting <laughs> inbreeding i think we're talking about aren't we yeah 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 so there would be no chance of inbreeding because obviously the license application yeah the the license processes yeah there's just no way that they would be okay and then another question i think it's from lewis who's had to leave us um but he would like to ask if you think that red kites 
are fed too much in Wales. For him, white-tailed eagles are the way forward. <laughs> um, I don't think that red... It's a hard question to answer, you know. Um, a lot of, you know, when I remember when I first started working, you know, across Wales with birds of prey, I never used to get to see a red kite much. Um, and now they obviously kind of uh, are widespread. And it's normally people assume that it's feeding stations, but it's generally not feeding stations. You know, if it was feeding stations, they would all be breeding around these feeding stations because they heavily rely on that. I honestly think that for red kites, in my personal experience, that their widespread distribution is attributed to farmland, grassland and invertebrates. They are heavily reliant. You know, for example, you mostly see buzzards in, in grass fields feeding off worms. And, and it's the same with, with red kites. You know, if you've got um, farmers kind of plowing down fields, you always see red kites flying around. They're after the insects, you know, the invertebrates in the ground. Um so yeah, I don't think that the feeding state, no, I don't think that red kites are being uh, overfed, no. Okay, I'm going to try and uh, put three questions into one here okay. now. So um, two of them are from students. So is it possible to get involved with the project at all? And also what programs have you used to create your SDM maps? And then the leading on from the maps, have you published a paper yet and are they available because somebody's quite interested in the Peak District? Oh, right. Okay. Um, oh, gosh, that there were a lot of questions. So the first one, so I, I remember the second, so the second question in regards to um, what software did we use for our, Max, um, for our species distribution models? It was Maxent. We used Maxent, um, Maxent Java for boars um i've completely forgotten what the first and second question was jason and do apologize <laughs> no that was the second question so the first one is are there any opportunities for undergrad students to get involved with the project okay there will be opportunities if we find funding so we are continuing our research in cardiff hopefully um so if you know and obviously um you know if i don't if we don't get funding obviously that that kind of that opportunity but yeah so but there would be opportunities um especially within cardiff university for undergrad students or if you want to contact me um you know yeah and we can discuss discuss opportunities then yeah um and what was the third question that's great and then the last one was with the um species distribution maps have you published and will they be available either as a publication or will you be putting them on, as a zoomable feature on the website? Yes, we are very um, cautious about releasing our data at the minute, especially for the localised whales um, stuff. For our SDMs, we're working on, um, at the minute, I'm working on publishing that. So um, it, hopefully it will be available very soon. Um, and we have had a lot of interest, obviously, from our species distribution models, especially in England, to restore golden eagles as well. Um, so, yeah, we'd be very willing to, you know, help this research guide other restorations as well. Yeah. OK, that's great. And obviously, um, the Eagle Reintroduction Project and South Wales Royal Society of Biology will be posting links to Sophie's paper when that becomes available. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, Okay, again, how do you ensure that there is enough genetic diversity within the reintroduction population? I think you've covered that with what you said about um, yeah, the license selecting the birds and the yeah. genetic diversity, not having siblings and what have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't, we would never be able to take, you know, um, two eagles out of the same nest. Um, we always take the runt out of the group, which is the lowest quality bird, um, and we can only take a golden or white-tailed eagle if there's more than one uh, of of you know offspring in that nest so yeah so they would just yeah that's how that's how they you know would never be inbred or how, how we control our genetics so. okay great uh claire have you got any other questions is she still i there? don't think so no I am you. I just keep on pressing the wrong button. Yeah, I'm, I'm going through them now, trying to see which ones I've missed. 
Um, I'm always available. I'm not sure why my question. Okay, sorry. So um, we had a question that was about um, a golden eagle has been living in the Cambrian Mountain area for a long time. I think he's talking about Edwina. Um, mm -hmm. And there's great evidence of a reintroduction. No problems with local farming community and enough prey to sustain it. Why is this not a suitable location for a golden reintroduction? Um, so she was in the Cambria Mountains, wasn't she? Yes. Cambria Mountains are coming up as one of the top three areas or best eagle habitat in Wales. So, yeah, and and to be honest, she's been a big part of our journey. You know, we were in dialogue with um, a number of people um, to start maybe um, reinforcing the population around Edwina. So um, kind of bringing down youngsters and sub-adults, um, you know, to start quickening up the, the breeding or providing breeding partners for her. But unfortunately, that hasn't um Obviously, she's passed away now, hasn't she? So, um, so yeah. But yeah, the Cambrian Mountains is still on our list to start looking into a lot in a lot more detail. And we understand, you know, I've worked um, with the farming community in the Cambrian Mountains. They contacted me um, when I first, um, you know, launched this project to tell to kind of, you know, tell me that uh, to keep Edwina, you know, kind of out of the public eye um and not really so yeah so i know that there's a very positive attitude there um yeah and that's potentially something that we can explore okay we have a um it's not a question but a request to dip into the conversation from david lewis who's been doing some work with the norwegian eagles i believe mm, okay so allow him to talk yeah brilliant david you can talk now if you unmute your own microphone. David, are you there? So no. How to use, uh, I don't know how to use these things either. So maybe he's struggling yeah, he had his hand up for a while and i said we'd come back to him at the end yeah yeah, yeah and it, it, it is in, can you hear me now yes yeah, yeah that's fine you, oh good right my name is david lewis um since 1961 i've spent more summers in arctic norway 70 degrees north where the white tail eagle and the golden eagle but mainly the white tail eagle is um a friend Mm -hmm. so as I map the mountains and the coasts of a large part of a certain fjord called Kvenangen Fjord, I come across eagles on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, but the populations have come and gone. In 2003, the 10 research geologists who are now uh, distributed all over the world came together for um, a visit to our old haunts. And we went to the island, an island called Lopa, L-O-P-P-A. Mm -hmm. And it was a misty day like today. And the, the island is a long island with a gentle slope one side and a 600-foot cliff on the other side, which is a bird sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we walked up to the top of the hill so that we were now on the edge of the cliff. And there were 13 white-tailed eagles flying around us yeah not away from us they were picking up the thermals and passing within 10 15 feet of us and they didn't go away no i've never seen that before normally if i come across a white tail eagle which is perched looking for food as they say they fly but yeah, they, do you know whether they were youngsters david or were they they must no, they, they were mature birds yeah, yeah. And in it's... fact, the a, a gentleman that was the one that looked after us in terms of accommodation over the period of time was able mm. to tell us that in his village, back in the spring, there were 19 of them circling. Yeah. So it's... that's very, very unusual. It is unusual. Yeah. yeah. We and had a very similar experience when we went out to, out to Norway as well. Where did you go? 
the Falklands is it? No, I think it, where did we go? That was a good question. Um, we went up to Alsund, near Alsund, and then. Alsund. Well, uh, between you and I, Sophie, Alsund is rather southern, darling. <laughs> yeah, but no, but we had very similar experiences there. You know, we we saw. Oh yeah, well, well, I, I'm double that distance north of there, seventy degrees north, a very mm. close segment. But in my hand, I have the skull of a white-tailed eagle. Oh, brilliant! Which I can pass on to you if you want. Oh, I, I would like. I'm not going to turn that down. I would love that. Yeah, please. Um, it's... you know, because I walk well in doing my work, it involved walking in the wilderness there. Yeah, the yeah. Point, this, it, it's just the skull, no other bones at all. It's a little oh, bit, tatty, a little bit tatty, but uh, I'm sure you can make use of it. Yeah, no, that would be great. Um, yeah, if you if you contact me through the 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 website, yes, I'm quite happy to do that. I would, yeah, thank you. But very further much. north, Sophie, you go further north than the Lofoten Islands. Mm. There are eagles there like you don't know what. I've oh, had goodness. one pass me. Um, bird colonies for seabird colonies are common along the coast, and as I'm mapping, you know, sitting down, recording what rocks are there. I might be tucked in behind a rock, and with that, um, a black back, great black back, robbed a young from a herring gull's nest on the floor, oh, ten yeah. meters in front of me. And with that, I, I, I didn't see it come in. I heard it. The eagle flew past me, about ten feet away, and took the bird, the the young bird, off the black back. And then the whole bird colony chased the eagle to, to the other landmass. <laughs> uh, that was something that was regular. Yeah. The, no, the way I would know there were eagles in the area is by the noises made by the other birds. Yes. Yeah, that is true. They always give the show away. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same way we, we say with other birds of prey as well, really. Yes. Yeah. 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 And the behavior of other species is mm -hmm. indicated that there's a bird of prey around. Yeah. 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 What an amazing experience to have so many eagles around you. Oh, well, but, but again, I, I, I emphasize in terms of an experience, it's, norm, it's normal or on a daily basis I would see one or two um, as I went, walked you know, through the mountains and through the valleys and, and, and so on. And that was a regular thing. But um, that one, it's only once it happened. That one yeah. year, one group saw 19 and we saw 13. But to have them flying around you, you know, when normally, as soon as they see you, they've gone. Yeah, not, not brilliant. But these weren't bothered at all. Yeah, no, I'll have to, we'll have to exchange contact details and we'll have a discussion about... Yes, about, you come. Yeah, but anyway, definitely. thank you for listening. I really no enjoyed worries, the program. You. you keep going on this. We've got to get them into the country. Brilliant. Thank That's you. Great. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you. For your contribution. Bye-bye. Bye, David. That's great. Uh, Sophie, I've just got one last question that I missed. Is there any issues with ospreys? Do they compete? Um, that's a good question. They don't compete. They have very different niches. Um, uh, ospreys obviously can um, plunge dive white-tailed eagles. They normally hunt in the littoral zone, um, which is the shallows, one to two metres of water. So no, but what they can do is they can steal food off our sprays, um, but they don't uh, cause direct harm. Um, so that's, yeah, so no and yes, really. <laughs> that's great. And on behalf of everyone, thank you very much for your talk. Um, no, I'll hand over very... to Henrietta now, our branch chair. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Um, so first of all, I'd like to uh, obviously thank uh, Sophie Lee Williams for her absolutely wonderful presentation. Um, so it's obviously a really fascinating topic that a lot of people are interested in. Um, and so thank you very much for presenting it um, in such a, a thorough and engaging way. Oh, um, you. <laughs> you're more than welcome. It's been an absolutely fantastic evening. Um, also, thanks to, uh, in particular, so Jason, Claire and Sam from the brunch committee who've been handling all the questions uh, in the background. So that's been really, really helpful. Um, and thanks to everyone who's attended this event as well and has submitted such interesting questions. That's been, um, yeah, it's been a really, really positive uh, and interesting event. 
So for attendees, uh, you will be receiving uh, a link to an online survey where you can leave uh, feedback about tonight's event. And if you can just spend a couple of minutes uh, filling that in, that's really, really useful. Uh, we really value feedback that helps us uh, with planning future events. And you can also find out about membership of the Royal Society of Biology as well. Um, our next event, so we have a number of uh, other online events in the pipeline. And our next event, there we go, uh, is a panel event, and that's going to be on the topic of cancer, where we'll have a number of experts uh, in the field of cancer research, um, giving short talks and then a question and answer session. And that's on November the 16th. So please do, uh, please do look out for that. I really hope to uh, see you at another event soon. And um, just to finish, thank you again, uh, Sophie Lee Williams, for an absolutely fascinating presentation. Thank oh, you very thank much, you everyone. Thank you. thank you. And good night, everybody.